Hey there, I'm here today with Dave LaPalamento, who's CTO of online video platform JW Player. How are you today, David? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Jan? I'm good. Listen, take a moment and tell us about JW Player, uh, your positioning and clients that you serve. Yeah, absolutely. So um, JW Player is a complete video platform for publishers, for broadcasters and media companies. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we have started years and years back as a, uh, like, the earliest way to get video playing on the web, right? And really had a uh, incredible following from developers and other media companies around JB Player. We've expanded into a full platforms so that includes transcoding and delivery and storage, um, live video and all sorts of uh, tools and solutions for people who wanna deliver video over the internet. Tell yeah. us about your training. How did you, where'd you start and how'd you get into compression? Yeah, well, so it's funny. I kind of, I guess I kind of stumbled into video. I was just, you know, I was a, a developer looking for a challenging field um, where, you know, it could be set with hard problems um, and uh, got involved with uh, an effort uh, years and years ago to turn flash video players into uh, HTML and uh, kind of fell in love with the engineering problems that we have to face every day in the video realm, particularly digital video. Um, so I, uh, you know, spent a bunch of years doing that when media source extensions came around, I was, uh, one of the early people playing around with using that to actually deliver HLS video on the web, which is now a pretty foundational component of most people's web presence, at least. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and have fallen in love with all of the technical challenges we have. We're in a space which is uniquely challenging in terms of technology and still keeps me, uh, Excited. What's your degree in? Uh, computer science. Yeah. Okay. How much of what you learned then is relevant to what you do now? Uh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. How much of it is relevant? So there, I think there's still aspects of um, like analyzing uh, algorithms and systems that is useful. It's nice to have a vocabulary to talk about it. But I don't, and you know, can't beat regular expressions. I think that's something I was interested in doing in university, which is still an important uh, part of my job. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's it's good building blocks. Do I use the building blocks every day? Probably not. Probably not. There's a lot mm -hmm. of reality of uh, engineering that goes on day to day, which you know, is uh, higher layers above that stuff. So so JW is notable, you know. For, for many reasons, but from a compression standpoint, you were one of the first to deploy VP9 and one of the first to deploy CAPS DRF. So yeah. you had pretty impressive stuff. I mean, that was four or five years ago, as, as I recall. And part of that was you have a pretty high end uh, executive who came from the from the Google group who did VP9. So I guess it's yep. understandable. Yeah. Um, what codecs are you using today for live into DOD? Yeah, so um, I would say in general use, there's really H.264 is, is leads the pack still. Um, we have uh, VP9 available to customers. We do have a bunch of customers who have deployed it, um, but there are, I mean, I think as, as all of us have kind of noted, there are, it's more complex to deploy VP9 still today. Um, and there are trade-offs that you have to consider if you want to deploy it. So really it's our sophisticated customers who, who tend to, uh, take advantage of VP9 in their actual deployments. And most people get by and, and do very well with H.264 still. So what, what are the trade-offs with VP9? Um, well, so a big trade-off is that you are, uh, so encoding, it takes longer and it's, it's you know, more computationally expensive. Um, the other thing that I think you have to factor in is you are storing extra renditions or of, of your content. And then, so that adds to your storage bill, even if it's a smaller um, actual file size overall, if you have to repeat it for H.264, you're still adding some factor onto your uh, storage. Um, you, the other thing to think about is there's a possibility that you're adding to kind of your, the cache pressure that you're putting on the CDN for particular uh, pieces of content. If you have an audience that is fragmented across VP9 and H.264, you're um, you know, adding another entry into that cache that you have to make sure has enough traffic for it to stay in there, or you end up going back to an origin and ruining the experience for somebody. Okay. Yeah. And what about, what about the live side? Are you using VP9 there as well? 
we're not using VP9 today on live. It's it's strictly H.264. Um, and I think that that's something that, you know, it's something we definitely are, are interested in exploring, but we haven't really uh, rolled that out yet. OK, you still doing um, CAP CRF for both of those on the VOD side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's that? How does that work as a as a uh, per title technology? I mean, is that effective for you? I guess it must be that have yeah. you periodically looked at other techniques and said, you know, someday we're going to do different or is it generally good? Well, so, so that one, I think right now we're generally satisfied with and we're not um, like actively looking around for uh, different approaches to that. Um, but it is one of those things where there are lots of interesting advancements going on continuously um, in the field. <laughs> and so, you know, if, if some new technique comes up, we would absolutely be very interested in adopting it. Yeah, I mean, if you can't say artificial intelligence or machine learning, then yeah, you know, well, you, 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 you're yeah. kind of stuck. But I mean, there's some really cool things going on with like neural net uh, auto encoders that are fun to like look at. But I think those are you know years away before they're uh, you know competitive with the codecs that are hand developed. Okay, so are, you're using uh, VP9 and, and X.264. Are those straight from FFmpeg or are you using custom versions of those? We're using them straight from FFmpeg, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Did you look but, at any of the custom versions? I So I don't, if we have, it has been a long time since we, we actually looked into that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we don't have any like uh, recent experience looking at the custom encoders. Okay, and in, in general, items. At a high level, what's your sense of the savings that VP9 delivers over H.264? Oh, um, hmm. I guess I'd have to, you know, I wouldn't want to throw a number out without um, double checking it. And so I don't have that offhand. So maybe I should uh, follow up with you about that one. Yeah, send me a note and we'll, we'll, we'll add it to the end of the article because that's pretty, okay. that's yeah. something that I think some readers are going to care about. Yeah, and okay. Who's, Where's the VP9 going? Is that going to Android and, and, and Chrome or is it going just to browsers or, or what? Well, yeah, so it's a little bit because there's it's a customer opt-in, they have a little bit of control over where that gets deployed. But yeah, it's Android and Chrome are going to be the, the lion's share, if not all of the VP9 traffic. Okay. Yeah. So you're not using HEBC. What does that tell us about your audience? HEBC with HDR and you know, high-end content. What's, you know, where do you see that going for you in the, in, you know, the very short term and the medium term? Yeah, so um, I, I would say that we definitely have a large uh, proportion of viewership, which is on uh, websites and in mobile devices. Um, and on those platforms, it often, you know, the uh, bandwidth savings that you really get out of HEPC aren't as uh, material. So it uh, can not have the same kind of uh, cost benefit. Um, where we are, you know, with all of, I guess, the globe, people are looking a lot more into uh, CTV and OTT uh, experiences. And that's where, like, I would expect we're going to see the demand for it. But as of right now, uh, most of our customers have been getting by with, uh, with H.264 on those platforms. OK. Yeah. And what's your, you know, everybody's talking about AB1, and you and I, when we, when we chatted before, we were talking about uh, some new statistics we saw about how YouTube is using AB1. What, how do you approach at JW, you know, looking at a new codec like that? I mean, how, what, is it something you're looking at now, or is it something you're going to say, hey, you know, somebody go look at this and tell us what the benefit is, or how does that work? Yeah, um, well, so uh, most of the time, the, from the technology implementation side of things, like, as long as there is a, uh, you know, reasonably production-ready version of the, the encoder, it's not too hard to, like, slot it into our existing transcoding infrastructure. So that's kind of the, the I mean, it's the nice thing about the way these, uh, this technology landscape is working out. Um, what tends to kind of push us in that direction uh, to evaluate a codec or not is when we kind of uh, see that the platform and uh, device uh, reach is, is getting to the point where we feel like we can deploy it to a good percentage of our customers. So. I would suspect the way that we're probably going to approach this is similar to how we did VP9 is we'll uh, you know go ahead and make it available to customers who choose to use it, um, and then kind of over time, um, our objective certainly a JW player is that almost all really none of our customers have to worry about what codec they're using onto what devices and to what platforms, right? And so 
In 2022, my guess is that we will be moving VP9 into the space where it will be more automatically configured and available for, for our customers um, on their content where that makes sense. Um, and AV1 is kind of like a little bit trailing further behind that, right? It's, it's just gonna take a little bit longer before the uh, cost benefit uh, equation kind of plays out. Okay, so how did I mean? How does that work for a codec like VBC, which isn't gonna, you know, all all the considers probably isn't going to be playing in Chrome anytime soon? Yeah, well, for that one, it's it's unlikely that we would uh, take a look at it for quite a while. Like moving into the browser is a big kind of uh, milestone, I would say, for codecs and um, getting on to uh, you know being available on mobile devices is a big one for us. So those. Uh, two things are kind of big triggers for us to start looking at it and uh, seeing if it makes sense. Okay. So switching gears, what are you using on the ABR format side? Are you, you mentioned HLS before, are you, are you pulling Dash anywhere? Yeah, we are. We do have Dash and HLS uh, available, um, you know, all over the place. Okay, are you, are you uh, dynamic packaging or are you, you know, packaging once and then kind of storing up on the cloud and distributing that way? We do dynamic packaging, so at least uh, swapping between TS and uh, fragmented MP4 um, for Dash and HLS. Now, you know, okay. HLS does have the fragmented MP4 option, but it's get a little bit better compatibility and it tends not to be worth it right now to worry about the packaging. So you've got one set of files on the edge somewhere or on multiple edges somewhere, and then a request comes in and they're going to package that for that user on the fly. Yeah. What's the overhead of that? And is there, you know, what, what's the cost? I guess you've done the cost benefit where, you know, store it twice as compared to keeping that alive with a, with a server component. What's that look like? Uh, in terms of uh, like cost or computation or performance? I mean, there's well, in a, terms of yeah. the cost benefit of dynamic versus static, I guess is. is... Oh, well, I mean, to me, I think no, you're going to, this day and age, I feel like you need to have a dynamic uh, packaging option of some sort. When you think about like DRMing uh, content, you think about the different packaging formats um, and just being able to adapt to changing device compatibility and different platforms. Um, even if we felt really confident that, you know, we needed to just have uh, an MPEG TS and a fragmented MP4 version of a file and we can store that and be static. Um, as time goes by, that changes. And um, the dynamic packager lets us adjust a whole bunch of those features of the video delivery um, to whatever's happening in the technology ecosystem without having to go through and do it, you know, a massive upgrade, um, even if it's just like a remuxing of all the content that we have in storage, which is significant. Do you see CMAF changing that anytime soon or, or is that just another ABR format? So I like CMAF a lot. And I guess the reason, like for me, it is about uh, minimizing, you know, cache fragmentation in the CDNs. Um, but I would still, the capability to do some light manipulation on the content before it goes out to the viewers is like incredibly powerful. Um, so even if we were, you know, essentially just using CMAF and not doing packaging on the fly, having the ability to like, for instance, DRM encrypt on the fly is a, uh, is a powerful thing to have in your arsenal. What percent of your content is going out with DRM? Um, you know, so let's see. I'm not sure. I don't have that number offhand, but I would guess it's like, uh, it's not the majority. I would guess more probably like down towards 20% or something like that. I'm not totally sure. It's less than half. Let's put it that way. Okay. What about advertising and search? And how much does that complicate, you know, what you do uh, for, for distribution, VOD and live? Um, well, yeah, so advertising does complicate what we do. I think the one nice thing about the, the way that um, that ecosystem has moved, particularly with uh, server-side ad insertion, is that um, you do have a reasonable amount of flexibility in your uh, codec choice as you move from content into ad and vice versa. Like you can't, today on most platforms, you can't switch to um, to VP9 and then back to H.264 in the middle of the stream. And as long as you're consistent with one codec throughout the presentation, you're fine. That's kind of another reason why um, H.264 is going to be hard to unseat, right? It, because you also have to get the ad ecosystem to kind of move along with you if you want to do uh, server-side ad insertion and um, 
the customers who are doing that high quality content that really benefits from VP9 are also pretty interested in doing things like ad insertion. Okay. Um, listen, that's all I got. I really appreciate you sharing these details because they're, it, you know, I deal in the theoretical and, and I don't know the actual application unless I speak to somebody like you. So I appreciate you sharing it with me and, and, the, and the readers. Um, anything you have for, for us or are you good? Um, yeah, nothing, nothing exciting to follow up with, but I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, it is a lot of fun to see, uh, like new codec technology rolling out in the wild and, uh, yeah, I appreciate, um, getting a chance to talk about it. Okay. Thanks very much. Take care. Yeah, you too.